Well, hey, my name's Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at City Church. Um, what a joy to be able to worship with you this morning, and um, just so thankful uh, for this time together, thankful to hear uh, from these students just about what God has uh, done in their lives over this last week, and really that um, this last week is a culmination of somewhat what he's been doing in their lives over the last year or so as they've been growing, but also just uh, as we were singing this morning, um, really thankful for uh, Kyle and Jessica uh, for leading us. Uh, it's, it's just a real gift. Yeah, please. You know, when you think about, uh, for me, I, I just see um, just the gift of all of the people, uh, many of you are a part of this, uh, that God has brought to our church. Um, and so when uh, Pastor Matt is away and he is taking some time, rightfully so, to spend with his family this week on vacation, that Kyle and Jessica can stand in their stead. And um, some of you, um, perhaps, like me, you haven't sang those songs since 1997, and, um, uh, but just what a gift to kind of be reminded of some of those things and um, to, uh, to, for them to lead us. And also, I want to uh, give a special shout out to Brother George, who joined us on the keys this morning, and what a gift he is uh, for that. Yes. So... This week has been awesome for our students, and I pray for uh, many of you as well that you have just experienced the Lord's kindness to you in some way. Um, I also uh, I want to thank Caleb so much for just his shepherding of our students and the way that he has led them. And I, I heard, obviously, I got to go to camp for just a, a little bit of that time um, and got to see what God was doing and up to there, but then also just hearing many of the stories. And in so many ways, um, camp and uh, what these students and the leaders experienced this past week is a little bit of a microcosm of the Christian faith. Um, so many good things, so many joys, um, just lots of uh, seeing God's hand at work, experiencing a ton of fun, um, and all of those things just in the kindness of the Lord that he brings. And yet, uh, they were not without trial, uh, and they had challenging circumstances that they faced as well. And so um, in that even, I, students, I hope for you as you experience that, that you'll see that the joy of watching and seeing God move in your life, in your friends' lives, and all of those things um, doesn't mean that there's not going to be any challenges that come your way uh, or insulate you from those things, but they do sustain us, don't they? Don't they encourage us? And so we keep our hearts and minds focused on those things as we walk through the trials of this life. Uh, We're in uh, the book of Hebrews, and so if you want to turn with me there, if you're a guest with us, um, we have been working our way through the book of Hebrews for the most part. Uh, Now for a couple of months, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6. Um, And one of the most challenging verses in all of our Bible, Um, hard to understand exactly what it is that the author is teaching us, what God's Word is saying to us, Um, and it's often debated and um, somewhat hard, again, for us to fully grasp exactly why we have this text. But what we do know is that it is in God's Word, and it's in God's Word for a purpose, um, and that is to edify us and to build us up. And so we can trust that even this hard text that I hope might, by the power of the Spirit, bring some clarity to this morning, that we can be encouraged and grow and it is useful for us. We shouldn't just skip over these things. But before we get to chapter 6, let us just sort of, let me give you a quick summary of where we have been and what the uh, letter to the Hebrews has taught us thus far. The first is, is that it, in the first really five chapters of this book, the author has been establishing Jesus as the great high priest. He is above all others. We know that this letter was written, again, most likely written to persecuted Christians, Jewish Christians. There's a lot of uh, belief that these Christians would have been residing in Rome, where they were sort of in... Uh, Uh, small house churches throughout the city, and this letter would have been a circular letter sort of distributed to them, sent to them, passed around, and to encourage them in their faith as they face the persecution of all of the challenges of being Christians in a pagan and a country that denies all of the things of Christ and even would kill them for their faith. This is what these Christians were facing. And so the author is establishing Jesus as the great high priest. He is over the angels. He's greater than the Old Testament prophets, the priests, Um, who practiced and did all of the uh, sacrifices on behalf of the people, Jesus, all of those pointed to Jesus. If we look at Hebrews chapter 4, 14 through 16, we see sort of the culmination or the central um, uh, idea of this in uh, verses 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect 
has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is a summary of what this letter is intended to do for these churches, to elevate Jesus, as we've said, my friend often praying this, Jesus be big, so that Jesus would be big in our hearts, that we have this great high priest seated at the right hand of God, a high priest who in every respect understands our weaknesses. If we can see our weaknesses, how much more does the king and the author of life understand our weaknesses? And he sees them, and he walked in those, and he understood them. A great high priest, though, who was without sin and therefore needed to make no propitiation for sins for himself. He did not need to go to the cross for himself. He didn't lay down his life for his sins. No, he did that for the sins of the world, for us. And a great high priest who made the final sacrifice for sin. And we know that it's the final sacrifice for sin because, as we've said over and over again, he is seated at the right hand of God today. God accepting that final sacrifice paid by Jesus himself to atone for sins. And so we can, with confidence, draw near to him. And then, as he explains this and unpacks that in chapter 5 a little bit further about this Jesus and who he was and his high priestly office, we came last week to a warning, the beginning of a section of warnings. And he says in verse 11, After describing this about Jesus of chapter 5, about this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. I won't re-preach that sermon and then give you this week's sermon on top of that. Don't be nervous. But if you want to go back and listen to that, I would encourage you to do that because it's the first sort of section of this time of warning where he is warning these people that, hey, you have become dull. Although you have heard the message of the gospel You have even professed faith in the gospel and believed in Jesus. You've become dull. I would love to explain more fully to you what it means for Jesus to be our high priest, but I really can't go there because you can't grasp it. Why? Because they were immature in their faith. They had not moved on from milk to solid food. They were still just taking in sort of these foundational, as it describes there at the end of chapter, or in the first verse of chapter six, the elementary doctrines of Christ. And so he gives this warning that they must have matured, they needed to mature in their faith. As we said last week, we never move on from the gospel. It is the foundation of all that we believe, all that we teach, all that we know of Christ is what he has done for us. Repentance and faith in him. But we must also continue to grow and mature. Students, this is a great reminder what God began through this week at camp, perhaps. Don't let this just be some sort of camp high that we sort of come off camp and we are walking so closely with the Lord, we've seen God move and all of those things and then just sort of let that dissipate. No, press in. If God moved in your life, he did that for a purpose to draw you closer, to take you into a further step of maturity. And I would say the same to leaders and to everyone in this church, wherever you are. Press into Christ and mature and grow up and continue to strengthen because, as we said last week, we have a purpose and a mission, God-given commission to go and make disciples. And how are we to teach if we're still, as it says there at the end of chapter 5, that we still have to be taught these things? We should be growing. So it's in the context of this warning that he began there at the end of chapter 5 that we will pick up in verse 4 of chapter 6. And in this text, as you'll hear, we face one of the, again, most challenging texts to understand. Verse 4 of chapter 6. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. If you've read this before, my guess is is that it has confounded you a little bit. 
What is it that the author of this letter is telling us? What is God's word teaching us? It seems by the words fallen away that perhaps he is saying that although we have once put our faith in Christ, we have fallen away and that we could lose that salvation that we have received from Jesus. But if you've studied your Bibles, and maybe you haven't, that's okay, that's why you're here this morning. But if you have, you might have heard or studied and listened to other texts that would seem to sort of confront that idea. One of the doctrines of our faith, something we call the perseverance of the saints, that the saints, those who have put their faith in Jesus because of Jesus, will persevere till the end. And so here we have this text that seems to say that there are those who've experienced God, they have been enlightened, they have tasted the heavenly gifts, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. They have done all of this, and yet now they have fallen away. Well, how do we reconcile this? Well, one of the things that we do, if you've been a part of our men's or women's Bible studies, you, would, you will have learned this, and that's just, by the way, a quick just advertisement for you to engage in those activities if you haven't had an opportunity to do so before. But one of the things that we often say in there is when we have a scripture, a text that is hard for us to understand, we're not exactly sure what it is teaching, we use scripture to interpret scripture. We look for places where we see the scripture is clear, and we say, let, us, let, let, us, let that help us to understand what is being said here. And so if we think about this idea of our salvation, what comes to us at salvation, and can our salvation be lost, can we fall away, then we need to look at some other texts and see what that says. And I would call our minds first here to Hebrews, where we have just again seen the discussion of Jesus, our great high priest, who is able to reconcile us to God. And if he is that high priest, supreme over all, and is able to reconcile us to God as one commentator said, if we could be lost before we reach heaven, wouldn't that imply that our high priest has weakness and is powerless? If he is seated at the right hand of God and is not able to secure us till the end, wouldn't that mean that there is something lacking in Jesus as our high priest? His sacrifice not being enough, his ability to secure us and his power to do so not enough, that would diminish the work of Christ. If that's still not perfectly clear, which I understand, maybe it's not, let's look at Jesus' own words to us in John chapter 10. I'll pick up in verse 27. 10, 27 through 30 says this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is Jesus' words to his disciples in the face of great persecution where he says to them, those who the Father has given to me, because I and the Father are one, they cannot be taken from me. This is one of the verses where we get this doctrine, the perseverance of the saints. Or maybe you've heard it said this way, once we have been saved, we are always saved. Another way, my simplistic mind, I'm kind of, you know, like this church family that's been around a while, gets this. I just kind of just cut to the chase. If the word eternal does not mean eternal, then it's not eternal. Did you follow there? Eternal means eternal. By definition, it means everlasting, forever. And if there was something that could interrupt that eternalness, then it would not be eternal. And I know that Jesus chooses all of his words very wisely. John 17 and, 17, or John 17 and verse 11 and 15, when Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer to the Father, he asks that the Father keep those who have been given to him. Are we to think based on what we just read in Hebrews, that Jesus' prayer to secure those believers until the end for them to persevere, that those prayers of Jesus would not have been answered, the Son of God's prayers to the Father when they are one would not be answered? Of course, that is not true. It can't be true. So we're left with this sort of confounding situation that we know our Bible teaches us 
from what we just read, and there are other texts, if I had more time, I could point to, that if we have been saved, if we have received salvation from Jesus Christ, that our salvation is secure until the end for all eternity. We know that to be true. So what are we left to do with Hebrews chapter 6? I can tell you many, many people have wrestled with that question. Some have arrived at this text and looked at this text and come to the conclusion that perhaps this author is in some ways calling us to look with hindsight on our salvation or perhaps the salvation of others. That we can only understand this if we're looking backwards in a sense. And we've done this before. This is what we wrestle with sometimes. We see someone who seems to experience and, and even sometimes may profess to be a follower of Jesus. There seems to be evidence of that. And then later in their life, at some point, whether that's days, weeks, months, or years later, they fall away and they reject the faith. And so looking back in hindsight, we would say, well, Hebrews 6 teaches us they were never truly believers in Jesus. We think of the parable from Matthew 13, the seed that fell on the rocky soil. And that is true. That can happen. That is something that can happen and does happen in our world. Students, again, I really want to encourage you to think about what you've experienced God doing and not allow that seed to fall on rocky soil. Don't just do the things of camp and sort of come back from this and sort of engage for a little time and then forget all that you learned about pursuing the Lord. But this, again, we would have to be looking backwards. And if we look at the context of the letter to Hebrews, it doesn't seem that that is what the author is doing. It's true that seed does fall sometimes on rocky soil. It's true that it will sprout up and look like it is bringing life, and then it will fade away. It will be thrown to dust. That does happen, but that doesn't seem to be what this author is addressing. There is, however, a very clear warning. And in this context, we see that he has started with the warning of maturing in our faith. He's warning these believers, you haven't gotten off of milk and, matu- and moved in maturity to solid food. You need to grow up. You need to move on, he says, and grow and build upon your faith. And so in this context, it seems, again, that we would then understand what he is saying to us is a warning, a warning that we can look the part, as Jonah said, the opposite of what he said, actually. He said, so often I don't feel like I look the part, or you might feel like you don't look the part, but it's what is in your soul and in your heart that matters most. The reverse of that is also true, friends. We can do all we can to look the part and think that we're doing all of the right things. It's a matter of what God has done in our hearts, our souls, that ultimately matters. And this warning is we gotta stop playing charades. We gotta stop pretending that we have these things. You know, when I was a teen, when we were singing those songs, like for the first time, I remember talking with some friends, and if you know my story, I, I grew up in the church and, and very active in the church, but um, I didn't grow up in a place where salvation And the gospel was talked about very freely and openly. And so I began to have friends and meet friends, and they would talk, and they would say, are you saved? And I'd be like, I I know how to swim. I don't know what what are you talking about. I don't need to be saved. I don't understand. Um, what, what What does this mean? What do you mean, am I saved? Am I saved from what? Is there like a bad guy around the corner that you're worried about for? No. They would talk, and they would use those terms. And they'd talk about the gospel, and they would share, and they shared it with me, and they talked about salvation, and what does it mean to be saved? Well, if we're going to understand this warning, let's first look at what salvation truly is. And I love the way that Wayne Grudem teaches on this text. He provides a great outline to define salvation. So there's five things that happen in salvation. The first is regeneration. 
we are born again. Do you remember when the Pharisee asked Jesus, how, must I, how can I receive eternal life? He said, you must be born again. New life, regeneration. The second thing that happens in salvation is there's conversion. There's repentance from sin. We are converted from one thing to another, from the darkness to the light. We turn. There's this movement away from sin. We are justified. We receive justification, which is simply a way of saying that we are declared righteous by God. Declared righteous by God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is a declared righteousness. That is an imputed righteousness that comes from God alone. That's justification. We're then adopted into God's family. You hear us refer to this church as a family very often. We talk in terms of brothers and sisters, my faith family. As we've had to move to two services, you can probably have, if you've been around a little while, you know we've tried to do all we can to sort of perpetuate and hold on to. We are a family This is a family of God, and we have been adopted into God's family. Some of you don't have good earthly families, and so God's gift of grace to you is that you've been adopted into this family. Now, this one's kind of messy because you got me around, but other than that, it's a pretty cool family, and we've been adopted into that family. Fifth thing is sanctification begins. We break from our sinful ways. We break from the desires of our past, and we turn, and we begin to look more like Jesus. Now, that is not perfection. That is not something that is immediate, but is a process that happens. All five of those things in salvation happen at one time. And did you notice that those things are the work of God? Yes, we repent, but it's in response to being given new life in Christ. Yes, we begin to participate in this sanctification. There's there's things that we do. We gather with the family of God. We spend time in his word and prayer, all those things. But it is the work of God in our lives. And those things happen all at once. You can't take one without the other. We don't get to just be adopted into God's family without being reborn. One time, a long time ago, I described it in this way. When I think of repentance and turning and sanctification, there was a time when I walked into a bathroom And as I began to look around me in that bathroom, I noticed that there was colorful wallpaper and a couch, and it smelled really nicely. I knew I was immediately in the wrong place, and I turned, (laughs) and I went the other direction. That is what it looks like. I saw and realized this is not right. This is, and I turned away, and I went the opposite direction. I did that physically, but spiritually and metaphorically, this is all what is wrapped up in our salvation. This is what it means to be saved. And when we are saved, all these things happen at once, and this is a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Would God begin that work and not bring it to completion? All the Bible scholars in the room are thinking Philippians 1.6 right now. No, of course, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He will do this. And the work of God is evidence in our lives through repentance and sanctification. We see it in our own lives and in the lives of others most as we see repentance and sanctification happening. One of the tests that's worth considering In your own life, have you repented of your sins? That was my challenge. I knew of Jesus. I understood that he had died on the cross for sins. I knew that he had taken his life up again three days later. You would have received no argument from me on those points. But it wasn't until I recognized that it was my own sin that put him on that cross that he went to atone for, that I needed to repent of my own sins, sins against an almighty and holy God, that is when the work of salvation began in my life. Have you confessed your sinfulness to God? Have you seen his hand at work in your life as he leads you away from that and you look more like Jesus? Can you say to yourself, Days, weeks, months, years, however long that might have been when you talk about and you sort of conf- and share with others that you came to faith in Jesus and you started walking with Jesus, do you look more like him now than at that point in time? Students, if you came to faith in Jesus this week, I wanna exhort you and encourage you, use that as a measurement out of your own heart 
Do I look more like Jesus today? Do I interact with my friends differently than I did with last school year? Do I deal differently with these situations? The challenges that come my way, do I understand them more clearly and sort of look at them through the lens of the gospel? This is a work of sanctification. These are all worthwhile questions. But now you're saying, okay, Ryan, you started talking about salvation, but he's talking about people falling away. So what about that? Well, let's come back to that. What is this warning? See, the warning is a forward-looking warning, not in retrospect do we see they have fallen away and this explains why they have fallen away, but forward-looking for everyone who would read this letter, it's a warning that can be understood that says, have I just participated and sort of played along with all the things of God without ever truly repenting, being born again, being adopted into the family of God, being justified and sanctified. We know that this can happen by Jesus' own words that Brody read for us. Depart from me, for I never knew you. That's one of the scariest verses in all of the Bible, friends. And I don't put that before you in condemnation or in judgment. You're here by the grace of God to say, stop playing around. Stop playing as if I need to do this and look this way. It's about the external work that I do that puts me and makes me right before God. Because you notice, when I talked about salvation, there wasn't anything related to my works of effort. No, it's what God has done. And so if we look at this text and see it as a warning to those First, starting the warning to those that were not maturing in their faith, and then it seems he backs up from there, and he is now warning those who have played around and sort of dabbled in the things of God but have never come to God. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened. They've heard the message. They've seen God at work. They've understood how he moves and what he does. They've tasted the heavenly gift, the church. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. They've experienced all of the things of God, even tasted the goodness of his word. You've heard some scripture read before. You've said, yeah, that sounds good. I like that. I'm gonna put that on my Instagram, so I'll remember that one. The powers of the age to come. You've experienced these things because you've been around God at work and God moving, and yet they fall away. Why? Because they were never converted. There was not ever truly new life that came. And he's warning, just as he had said other times before in this letter, don't forsake today. Listen to this message while today is still today. Let today be the day of salvation. And so I want to encourage you again, if you hear this, yes, heed this warning. And perhaps it's to bring some conviction and some caution. You should say to yourself, I need to Think about my walk with God, my walk with Christ. What has he done? Have I ever repented and believed? And know that we can't play around. We don't just get to act the part because that is not where new life is found. And this warning, I hope you would hear again as a message of God's grace to you. That he brought you here this morning So you could hear, you've sort of been doing this because it's the culturally acceptable or right thing to do. You were raised to do this. I want my kids to sort of be raised in this environment, and yet in your own life, in your own heart and soul, you've never come to faith in Christ. By the power of his spirit this morning, would you believe? That's the call. And we know that this is hard because, and we've experienced this, how many times have we seen Those who have fallen away, they cannot be restored again to repentance. They've heard the message over and over again. I'll confess to you, before we moved to Melissa, around 2009, 2010, my family and I were considering where God was leading us, and I knew that we were called to um, plant a church, and we were really willing to go anywhere, at least I was, my wife, Les, you know, she's a Texas girl. I'm a Texas guy too, but I, I was like, you know, just a little more faithful. And um, <laughs> don't, 
She's not in here, so I can kind of pick on her. She was in the early service. I, I, I held that back last time, but <laughs> it's not true. Anyway, but in that, I, 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 I really wanted the Lord to send us somewhere far away. I wanted to go to the Northeast. Got some friends here from the Northeast, and so I wanted to go maybe to the West Coast. I have a lot of friends here from the West Coast now. I was, I was trying to come to you before you came to me, and I wanted to do that because in my heart and mind, I had grown up in this context here in Texas, here in the South, where attendance in church and believing in the Bible and professing faith in Christ just seemed to be the culturally right thing to do. And if you didn't do that, you were somewhat maybe odd or the, the, the outsider, again, when I was younger. That's changing now in our context. But I wanted to go to a place where people who rejected Jesus knew they rejected Jesus, and I was going to go and hopefully point them to Jesus. Why? Because here in this part of our country and the world, and many of you have experienced this, it's been like a little bit like the frog in the boiling water. We just kind of do church. We go, we hang out, we enjoy the community. There's good people there. They're moral. It's the right thing to do. If I don't go to church, my neighbor will kind of look at me weird. That's what we were all raised in. And how hard is it? I'll just tell you very hard for that individual to understand what Christ has done, to find repentance and to be brought to new life. So I thought, Lord, maybe send me somewhere where I thought, candidly, the task would be a little easier. They'll know they don't know Jesus, and they'll reject Jesus very clearly, rather than being people who have been enlightened tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, seen all the good things of God, and never repented and believed. It's a challenging text. It's a scary text. But there is hope in this. Notice in verse 3, just before he gets there, as he's warned about growing in maturity, he said, and this we will do if God permits. If we jump now ahead to verse 9, He now speaks directly to these brothers and sisters in these churches. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Notice the difference there. He talked about all of those those five things that they had experienced, enlightenment and tasting of the Lord and experiencing the Holy Spirit, but they had never received salvation. But for these people, he was encouraged because they had experienced true salvation. So the message is a warning. A warning to all who would come to Jesus, not for Jesus himself, but for the things of Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I want to be a part of his church. I want to do the things of Jesus because that all seems good to me and I think it will help me in my life. But I don't really just want Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, meaning that it's all about Jesus. We don't come to Jesus for the things of Jesus. We come to Jesus so we can have Jesus. He is our aim. He is all that we need. He is salvation. And so I hope If you've heard this warning, perhaps it has caused your heart to grow heavy this morning. Let today be the day of salvation. Stop playing around. Stop feeling like I just need to act the part. I come and do these things because it feels right, because my neighbors, my friends are there. Those are all good things. Those are all good gifts from God, all the things that we experience as a part of his family. Repent and believe that the kingdom of God is at hand. And come to Jesus. So this warning won't be you because when you come to Jesus, you will be his forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, I ask for your help to take my words about your true, infallible, and holy word. And I pray that only the truth would remain in our hearts this morning. If there's any misstep that I have made, God, I pray that you would just strike that from our records and 
only leave what you want us to know. And I do pray, God, if there's anyone in this room, which I've got to assume there are more than likely many, who've been dabbling in the things of you, a part of your church, coming to worship, sending kids to camp, going to camp. And yet they have never been born again, repented of their sin, understood what it means to be eternally justified by an almighty and holy God and to be recognized as the righteousness of his son. Would you move in hearts and souls today and welcome many into your family? and allow holiness to overflow in our lives. Only you can do this, Jesus. Pray your spirit would just wash over us even now. Give us hope. As we sing in just a moment and we exalt your name, Let that exaltation be songs of praise from hearts who are fully yours. Who exalt you because we have received you, Jesus, not the good gifts that you shower upon us. Make it all so, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name.